Hey you guys, welcome back to the channel. It's me, B. Riley. You can still find my name floating around over there. And today on Reviews, Restorations of Rock and Roll, we are going to be reviewing a vintage 1979 Fender Stratocaster in Cherry Burst. This guitar is absolutely dead stock, as it was from the factory. And I know that because the customer who dropped it off is the original owner of this guitar. He bought it brand new in 1979. So let's go ahead and get past the credit business and let's get to it and have a look at this thing. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the tone and we're gonna talk about the playability and we're gonna talk about the, you know, the build quality and the investment value. Same as we do when we review any of the other guitars. But one thing I really wanna talk about at this, at the back end of it is, is uh, in summation, is it worth you know, to throw in because I mean, strats have such a wide variation in price. So with that wide variation, um, what are you getting for throwing an extra grand into the pot? What are you getting for an extra $900 when you contribute that to the 800 you would have spent on a 1960s Vintera, um, you know, made in Mexico strat. So that's what we're going to talk about. Is it worth it ultimately at the end to throw in that kind of money just because something has been on the earth for the last 25 to 35 years and does it make that much of a difference but before we get into that we got to go ahead and plug it in so let's go ahead and do that and have a bit of a root around on the tone side of this thing <laughs> So right out the gate, the tone on this thing, as far as uh, you know, just the sounds you can get out of this. This guitar has that, that wonderfully indescribable bag of gravel tone that you get out of some of these, and uh, the pickups are very, very versatile, very dynamic. The the attack on the string really comes through as it translates through the amp. Uh, so you have this fantastic expressive interplay uh, between solo and chords that you can do and kind of really shove it around. Uh, yeah, I mean, when it comes to the tone on this guitar, this is easily one of the best sounding strats that I've had the fortune to play. And I've played some strats from the 50s and from the 60s, and I know that sometimes a bad setup can really shoot you in the foot. Um, but uh, I would definitely be more than willing to say that this is easily one of the best playing and best sounding strats that I've ever played. Now, that's going against reissues, but it's also going against guitars from the early 1960s, uh, right up until the late 1960s and early 1970s. So this particular 1979, you know, non-25th anniversary strat kind of flies in the face of convention. It's pushing against the idea that older is better. The truth of it is, is that Older may be more valuable, but not necessarily better. I can't argue with the fact that this guitar is an absolute bruiser. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about this thing from an investment standpoint. And uh, you'll have to forgive me if the teacher in me starts to become a little bit more prevalent in the moment, because sometimes metaphors are just the easiest way to connect the dots. Uh, look at this thing like a stock. Look at any guitar like a stock, really. Uh, and uh, stocks, as variable as they are, they do have a tendency of finding themselves uh, when it all shakes out um, in between two polar extremes. And for this argument, we'll say the two polar extremes would be Bitcoin and Disney. 
Okay, so you got Bitcoin and then you got a blue chip. Now, Bitcoin and Disney are both valuable stocks, but the only thing is, is that one of them is explosive, tumultuous, uh, monumentally profitable if you get your timing right, and devastatingly damaging if you get your timing wrong. And then you've got uh, the blue chip. Now, the blue chip doesn't have the same fluctuation in value. It is not the same assessed risk. Essentially, with a blue chip, if you put 2K in, you're getting 2K back out of it. You're not buying the stock as much as you're buying its solidarity, the resiliency of the stock, the capability to uh, withstand the influx in Wall Street and the tumultuous fluctuations of its markets, um, and still hold its value and still be a safe place for your money. For this argument, I would say that the 79 Strat is that blue chip. It's Disney. It costs a little bit more. You're going to have to shell out a little bit more to get your foot in the door but you're almost guaranteed no loss whatsoever. The risk associated with this particular purchase is extremely minimal. Whereas say a couple months ago, if you were buying an Epiphone Casino, you might've been buying it for an inflated rate because Get Back was out and it had created a temporary lift in the price of those guitars. The only problem with that is, is that if you are on the wrong side of that, if you were buying when it was high and selling when it was low, you're gonna lose that money. If you bought before because you saw the ads for Get Back coming out and you anticipated the lift in the price, then you won that round. But if you're on the other side of it, then you lost that round. With a 79 Strat, with this type of vintage, with a guitar in this kind of shape where it hasn't been hacked up or routed out or anything like that, you're almost guaranteed, if not completely guaranteed, to get every dollar you got back out of it and it'll actually cover for the difference of an inflation. Because if you bought in at two grand, it doesn't matter how much you paid for it. It matters how much it's worth in the modern world. So if inflation has really cut the dollar to ribbons, it doesn't matter. The amount will then fluctuate higher and you'll still get your same per dollar amount out of it, if not with a gain. Okay, so we're gonna bring you in real tight here. Let's talk about the build quality on the inside of this thing. And uh, I just wanted to open up the front of it because obviously, you know, a lot of uh, sins are revealed when you open up the pick guard on an old Strat. And I can tell you right off the bat that what we are looking at as a whole here uh, is that we have a pretty severe amount of oxidation here. You'll see this chalky residue that's left on this aluminum. Essentially, it's a kind of a, it's rust for aluminum. It's, it's just this aluminum oxide that kind of falls off. Uh, aluminum does oxidize unlike uh, a lot of people think that because it's aluminum that you don't have to worry about rust there's just a different version of corrosion so we've got a little bit there which is consistent with uh, the standardized moisture that you would usually get in an instrument that's being held and played we're also seeing a severe buildup of dirt around the outside perimeter of the pick guard regarding wiring it's all nice and tidy this is dead stock no one has messed with this and the customer had mentioned that he was a little concerned that the signal was clipping out uh, up on the uh, low E uh, during hard striking. And admittedly, I have yet to replicate that problem. So we might have to actually go further into his uh, you know, power chain and his, um, his uh, signal chain as it goes through his cables and his pedals and maybe even his amp. Uh, it's pretty tidy under here, though. Pickups are all original, uh, which is nice. The wiring is all original, it's still wearing the tape from the late 1970s. Uh, this is kind of peculiar though, I'm looking over here and I'm seeing an ingrained stamp here as though maybe it might have been left here by service. Typically I've not seen Fender employees actually use an imprint on this uh, foil uh, sticker that's on the back, the shielding sticker that's on the back, but here I can see a date scribed in which is 5481. That's a funny coincidence. Uh, today's May the 4th. So may the 4th be with you. Yeah, May 4th, 1981. My speculation here would be that this guitar had been given a setup uh, in 81 and that a tech decided to make their impression known. It also could be that we've had a previous owner, a lot like that 65 Jaguar that we had, uh, putting a marking in here. You got to remember back then you didn't have Instagram, you didn't have Facebook, you didn't have YouTube. So putting out a stolen guitar ad back then was, well, you were looking for a needle on a stack of needles you weren't going to find. So what people were doing back then, I know I did this as well, is uh, they would engrave a series of numbers or, uh, you know, a uh, series of initials on a hidden part of the guitar. 
so that uh, if there was any type of uh, legal intervention, they could point to the guitar and say, well, I know what's under the pick guard and uh, be able to further uh, prove that they had some intricate knowledge of the guitar, which would usually only be had by the owner. Uh, so we see that there. Five position switch, pots are all very, very tidy. Uh, this guitar definitely is a one owner guitar because if it had gone through multiple owners, you would have multiple incarnations. You know, different people want different things. Uh, you know, so they would have changed some stuff up. Ground is kind of weird. Uh, it looks like someone's put glue over it, funny enough. It's kind of a strange thing. You see all the factory shielding. There are factory markers in here. And uh, much to my surprise, the neck pocket is much better than I thought it would be. Uh, in my experience, the 70s guitars always have a little bit more of a liberal neck pocket so that you have a bit more of a fluctuative room. And here we see the two recesses that are meant so that as the neck pivots, that you still have that play there where you can adjust so that your strings aren't, you know, overhanging on the frets on either side. Uh, but the pocket itself, as far as the sides, is nice and tight. There's almost no play in there whatsoever. A little bit surprised about that. And, uh, you know, the big thing about these is a huge value increase. No swimming pool route. Uh, I cannot tell you how many of these old guitars I've seen come across where someone got in there with a drill and a big old, you know, wood bit and just started spiraling huge chunks of wood out of it. I'm totally down with modifying stuff myself, but in the modern world, we have so many different pickup selections and, and uh, options from all these, you know, multitudes of aftermarket makers that we really don't have to start hacking up old timber just for the sake of fitting a humbucker in there. One thing I noticed about this guitar is, is that the saddles are all totally dimed in a straight line, and I thought for sure we were going to have intonation issues, uh, but when I plugged it in and played it, the only thing I did notice was there was a bit of a counter resonance happening on the low E, and I suspect that is because this pickup was adjusted ever so slightly higher, probably because the uh, original owner had mentioned that there was a clipping in that uh, on that string when he was playing. Maybe he was trying to bump the volume by raising it slightly. But I did notice that instead of uh, the low E resonating in a conventional sense in which it is all resonating, that it was pivoting over the pickup and essentially making this kind of double Dutch resonance. And I've noticed that a lot on strats, that as you get up around the 10th fret, that the thickness of the string, the position of the string, and the design of the guitar, uh, that these single coils tend to grab that center section. So if you can imagine, you know, you're holding a baseball bat and you're moving it back and forth or fluctuating it around, now you have this, this uh, fulcrum point in the center, and that's essentially what this pickup was acting as. So when I was playing up around the 10th fret, I could hear this kind of subtle oscillation. It was really low, but it was in the frequency, and I could hear it there. And that was a result of this pickup being a little too high and creating a magnetic field that was essentially interrupting the natural vibration of the string, dampening it slightly, and causing the string to oscillate from other sides, like a jump rope that's not being swung properly. Uh, so there's that. Overall, the build quality on this guitar is fantastic, and I really, once again, am surprised. I'm not trying to paint 70s strats as some catastrophic nightmare, but we all read those magazines and read those, you know, posts for so many years talking about how Fender took such a huge step back in the 70s. And a couple months ago, I had a 75 Mustang come through. And on that guitar, I definitely saw some of the shortcomings. But there's a little part of me that thinks that maybe those shortcomings might have been overblown, especially when it comes to the flagship. Because as much as Fender wanted Jazzmaster to be the big stuff, the Strat has always been their bread and butter. And that brings us up to the last bit, and this is a big differentiation. The finish. The Cherryburg's finish on this is gorgeous, and once we get down to buffing it and everything like that, it's going to look literally factory brand new. But this is the fuller plast stuff, which means that you have essentially a color coat thrown over an extremely thick, extremely durable clear coat. Uh, and this is how Fender started doing all those ash body natural finishes during the 1970s. That wasn't really a clear finish, it was just the fuller plast base but buffed. So you've got to remember that these are not like the ones in the 60s. They will not have a natural wear pattern. You will have some checking prevalent where you've had temperature discrepancies or a large temperature swing, uh, but technically speaking, uh, for the most part, you're just not going to see that, that super intricate checking that you would get out of the 1950s to the 1960s. You've got to remember that those nitro finishes were extremely unstable, a lot like the nitrate guards. Uh, and they destabilized over years and they couldn't handle temperature swings, so you got a lot of that weird wear and checking. 
But once you get past that whole deal, if you're not big on having a guitar or you don't need to have a guitar that just looks like it was dragged out from bottom of the Mississippi River, then the 1970s, especially from 75 on, are an excellent economic choice because once you get past the nitro, the rest of this thing is just absolute singing. Okay, you guys, so obviously we've had a chance to talk about tone and about uh, some playability there. And, uh, you know, usually, I'm going to be honest, when I'm doing a review on a guitar, I'm a little bit more um, ruthless, I guess. I try to look at it in a pragmatic sense of, of use versus investment and, and uh, try to keep it even-handed. Because really when it shakes out, these reviews are kind of funny that way in that they are... Um, you know, they are preferential. Uh, every one of us is going to have a different style that we seek and everybody is going to have a different idea of the type of tone that they're chasing and we're always chasing it, which is why we're on YouTube talking about guitars because this is just another way for us to kind of, you know, expand that, you know, that thought process of what we're digging into next. Uh, but obviously with this one, I did jump in wholesale and the reason is, is that uh, it's worth it. Honestly, when it really shakes out, like we were saying at the beginning, you know, when it comes down to the summation of it, this is a guitar in which the amount of money that you're spending is um, not more than the enjoyment that you'll get from it. From an investment standpoint, it's an excellent investment standpoint. There's almost no, you know, monetary loss potential there. There's no speculative risk with the price point and its fluctuations. The prices just go up. They don't go up super rapid but they keep going up. As far as the playability, it's got a really nice contemporary neck on it. And I'm gonna be honest with you, those are words that I don't put together too often because when we touch upon, you know, the preferential, uh, you know, uh, state of our playing, you know, what we like to play and all that sort of stuff, typically I go for the C shape um, and usually contemporary and uh, desirability are two words that don't sit in the same sentence for me as far as guitars go. Uh, and the reason is, is because, you know, it's just what I prefer. But on this, it does have a very contemporary neck that is really, really nice to play. It's very, very well broken in. And the pickups jump in. They got that gravel, like we were saying. They have a really excellent dynamic response. And it's a great reminder of what happens when just a couple extra bucks are thrown in. You get that, that sweetness to the tone where everything kind of falls together and the chordal structure is, is really well maintained. There's a there's an excellent chordal structure there when everything is in tune and the harmonics and everything really bounce off each other nice. Uh, this guitar just seems to be very happy in that way in a tonal sense. I can't find a fault with it. There's no hitch. There's no one part of this guitar that makes you say, mm, but you're going to have to deal with that. Once you buy it, the cost of keeping it is almost absolutely nothing. Parts are available left, right, and center, except for those F-tuners. As if you had tuned in on the 65 Jag episode, you saw that we had a struggle with trying to find those. Um, but there's really no hang-ups on this. This guitar doesn't have any drama. It's not coming to you with issues. It's just ready to go. Uh, so at a price point for these types of guitars, you're looking at somewhere between, mm, you could probably get one, maybe a refinish for about 13 or 1400 bucks that's gonna need some love. Uh, if you spend about $1,800 on these, you will be able to get a, a solid example. And if you're going into the 22 to the 25 range for the strats that are saddled up between, say, 1975 and about 1980, 1981, uh, before they started to transition back into the small headstocks, you're looking at about that. About 22, 2400 for a really nice example. Buy something that you like, even if you mean to sell it later. Because if you like it, you're not going to sell it too fast. And if you do sell it slowly, you're gonna get that money back out of it that you put into it, you're gonna feel good about it, and that's gonna give you a little bit more loose expendable income. You can then divert further into another project that maybe has a little bit of a higher price tag. Something for you to think about. Anyway, 
This guitar is awesome. I can't say it enough. Uh, playing it is great. Taking it apart is great. Putting it back together, even more fun. The beauty of a Strat is, is that it's kind of like a hobby kit. You can do it yourself and every price point has its benefits. But from an investment standpoint and from a personal playing standpoint, from my personal preference, I would definitely advocate buying something along these lines. You won't lose a dollar. You're going to enjoy your playing a lot. And if you enjoy your playing a lot, you're going to play more. If you play more, you're going to be more tight. Your chops are just going to keep improving. And speaking of which, I need to stop talking and I need to start practicing right now. I only got a couple hours before I got to go back into work. And, uh, you know, that's the whole point of this whole thing. Play more, right? You know, tilt that work-life balance and get a bit of noise out of the box with the tubes in it. Anyway, I hope you guys have a beautiful afternoon. I hope you enjoyed this review. I know this review is a little bit different than the last one. We're kind of evolving the reviews a little bit, changing them up a little bit. Feel free to give me your feedback. Throw it in the comments section. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you like this sort of material, if you're like me and you're a bit of a gearhead and you like taking things apart. This is obviously the type of place where that's what we're doing frequently. And I love the input in the comments sections lately. Um, I've been saying that more and more in the vids because the comments have just gone from you know, at the beginning of the channel, one or two trolls who were like, hey, look, a guitar. And now we have these really in-depth conversations talking about gray market legality when it comes to counterfeits or the concept of digital amp, you know, versus tube amp, conventionality versus innovation and all these things. And uh, the beauty of it is, is everybody's bringing these really well-informed points. So, um, you know, it's nice that the videos are getting views, but what I really enjoy is just looking at all this really well-informed, uh, you know, tete-a-tetes going back and forth in the comment section. Anyway, have a beautiful day. Don't forget to hit like, share, and subscribe, and uh, we'll see you next week. Cool. See you guys.